Let's go ahead and do the meeting beginning ritual, everyone. 起立，面向佛堂，参加三鞠躬、一鞠躬、再鞠躬、三鞠躬，参加各位点传师一鞠躬，开班一鞠躬，请坐下。Please be seated. I, I was going. Uh, to spend this morning talking about the procedural aspects of the daily rituals, and, and while I think a, a knowledge of the mechanics is worthwhile to have, as I considered giving this talk this morning, the thought dawned on me that perhaps the much more important aspect of the rituals to discuss. Is is not so much the mechanics, but the reasoning and the understanding. This isn't quite the same as the familiarization with terms.、Um, the terms can be found in and understood from、uh, pretty much the book. And for those of you who are interested in learning to to do the rituals on your own. Uh, the books can be made available.、Uh, the current edition says on the title page, if I can get to it here, the disciplines and rituals of Iguando. Okay, this is a revised edition from the first、uh, copy, the first edition that I learned from. With many improvements, thanks to an awful lot of hard work by folks there at the temple. However, once again, contemplating giving the talk on the mechanics, I thought it was much more important to, to once again understand the how, the why, and the what. And so, with that thought in mind.、Um, A couple of things we need to, to cover that I have not talked about before. There is so much disinformation and misunderstood information available in this day and age,、uh, particularly on the internet. Some by really well-meaning folks with good intentions, and some by folks who just don't know out of ignorance, and some that's actually malicious. That it can be extremely difficult to sort out what is and is not、uh, part of the authentic teachings. One of the misunderstood con concepts、uh, in the West that just seems to never quite want to die off is the concept of ancestor worship. That topic comes up again and again and again. As does the topic of the worship of the Buddhas, and and I understand kind of how how and why that happens. Even when you read the original text of the rituals,、uh, there is the word worship used in them. But worship isn't quite an accurate、uh, an accurate term, and, and while. Uh, there is a great deal of veneration for one's ancestors, and a great deal of veneration for the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Veneration is not the same thing as worship. The term veneration much more accurately describes a deep and abiding respect for、uh, something or someone, and that's an entirely different thing than than worship. There is also a deep and abiding veneration for the principles that drive the universe, for the Tao itself, for the processes that spring forth from it, from the various facets of it that we describe in in terms that we can try to get our heads around. The terms such as Wu Ji and Lao Mu, the ancient mother and the void. Are are not discrete entities. They are 
peerages, aspects of the Tao itself that perform functions, if you will, that have great significance and meaning and without which we would not be able to contemplate the nature of our own existence. But just as everything else that exists is part and parcel of that path in that way, those things are part and parcel of the Tao itself. There is nothing that exists that isn't, at least not as far as we know. Lao Tzu says, you know, to, to look for its front, it cannot be seen. To follow it, you can't see its back. Uh, my Chinese brother Wang Lu tells me that the Tao has no edges and no corners, uh, <laughs> which I always find uh, amusingly precise. That as far as we know, there is no beginning and end to the Tao itself, no beginning or end to the universe that we can observe, and, and even more so for the remainder of it that we can't observe. And so it becomes impossible for us to conceptualize these things in any other than woefully inadequate words. It is because it is at some level necessary for us to use language to describe the attributes of that which cannot be seen that we wind up in the quagmire of, of interpretation and language that is the difference between veneration and worship, between understanding and misunderstanding, between real knowledge and wisdom and, and simply talking around the subject. The conduct of the rituals using language is the outward exhibition of what should be a deeply personal and spiritual connection to something that cannot be seen or touched or described or felt by anything that we have at our disposal. When we speak of Ming Ming Sangdi, the bright, clear, eternal divine radiance, the overarching governing principle, some people would interpret that to be God, and, and I suppose if, if that interpretation works for them, that's okay. But understand that that overarching divine principle neither seeks after desires nor requires our worship or our veneration. It exists. It is a principle. It is a universal rule, a set of universal laws that are our pathway to knowledge and enlightenment one day. Whether or not we pay obeisance and worship to any of the concepts uh, and items that are found on and around the altar table of the shrine is not nearly so important as whether or not we apply those principles and understand those concepts in our hearts and minds. Those are the things that matter. Those are the things that, that truly count. But yet, once again, because we're stuck in the construct of language and the things that we can, can wrap our brains around, our rather woefully pitiful attempts at description are all that we have to try and, and understand a process that is so much bigger than we are, we can never hope to fully understand it. I do my very best before I perform the rituals to place myself in a, in a a mental space of, of gratitude and thankfulness for every day that I'm allowed to breathe on this planet. I do that especially these days because I should have been dead when I was 40. That's when I had my first heart attack. And by some miracle, I've been allowed to hang around here for about another 16 years or so. And 
all evidence seems to point to the fact that I'll be around for a few years more. I'm pretty happy about that. So is my family. But I count every day that I've gotten in my life since, uh, since the day I had that infarct as a freebie, a gift, something that I didn't deserve, but got anyway. And so when I perform the rituals, I'm instantaneously reminded that this day that I have uh, in front of me at the 6 a.m. ritual and that I'm in the middle of at lunchtime and winding up at evening time is a gift. I forget what movie I heard it from, but somebody said, you know, today's a gift. That's why they call it the present. <laughs> okay, I can agree with that. No matter how the day goes, whether it's a great day or a pitiful day, a happy day or a sorrowful day, I'm always happy to be here and happy to be alive. I'm always happy to have this opportunity to share with you. I'm always, always happy to learn and to grow and to refine and improve myself and to do the things that, that move uh, my family forward. Those things all bring me a good deal of joy. That being said, it isn't always easy to be happy all the time. And sometimes it can be downright difficult to bear in mind that the reason that we are supposed to be performing the rituals is not to carry on some transactional conversation uh, with some invisible, intangible, personified deity somewhere who's going to give us an A on the algebra test or take away our addictions to alcohol or cigarettes. That kind of, of religious experience is heavily ingrained in the Western mind. It is the third concept that I have perhaps the hardest time disentangling from the Western brain. That the, the divinity that awaits us is not some little old man with a shepherd's crook saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because no matter what your concept of God is, the very second we, we draw that mental picture, we put him in a box a box of gender, a box of physicality, a box of attributes that we can understand. When we do that, we limit both our own ability and the ability of the wonderful effects of karma and the Tao to continue to operate within us because we have constrained and limited it by our understanding which is always incomplete. And, and so, other than for the sake of explanation and understanding for the Western mind, I refrain from using the term God because of the mental picture it draws. I much prefer to refer to the divine essence Ming Ming Sangi, if you will, the ultimate overarching principle. I mentioned we don't worship the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas either, and we don't. Praying to a ceramic figurine sitting on an altar table is a wonderful exercise, but it produces no results. The figurines are not there for us to pray to and beseech for blessings, kindness, and, and transactional favors. They're there to remind us of the principles for which they stand. The, the things that made their lives worthwhile and their enlightenment imminent. The Buddha Jigong, the, the great teacher, is the conveyor of knowledge and wisdom. 
He's also probably amongst the most colorful uh, and interesting of the various figures. He's often depicted as uh, somewhat raggedy and uh, an enjoyer of his uh, of his wine and laughter. It's uh, an interesting peerage for one whose gift to us is knowledge and wisdom. In the West, we consider those folks as needing to be much more severe. <laughs> it's uh, good for me to remember from time to time that the Buddha Jigong in my shrine is smiling at me all the time, sometimes probably laughing himself silly, but at least my heart's in the right place. Bodhisattva Guan Yin is sometimes referred to as the Thousand Hand Bodhisattva, not because she has more than two arms, although some of the peerages of her are portrayed that way, but because she appears to those who need her as exactly what they need at the time. She and I have a remarkably special relation. I know this Bodhisattva. Personally. And while I won't go into all the details at the moment, I can tell you that she brings to those in need exactly what they need to hear, exactly what they need to have when they need it. And there is no greater blessing. She's there to remind us of temperance, mercy, grace, forgiveness, all of the wonderful yin uh, attributes that we all tend to lose sight of on Monday morning when we head off to work. But like Senior Master Yang, I hold the Bodhisattva in high esteem. And yes, I hold Senior Master Yang in very high esteem. She was a remarkable person, a truly wonderful, wonderful person who took a personal interest in my cultivation and helped me to, to get to where I am now. So in my mind, she's right up there with the Bhagwan Yin. The Buddha Maitreya at the center of the altar is not there to remind us of our obesity programs nor is he there to bring you a bright and brilliant future through no effort on our own parts. I talked about as the Buddha who is not yet incarnated, he's not there because he doesn't exist yet. He's there because he bears certain attributes that are important for us to, to work on and, and, and develop and, and use in our lives. In the West, when we say somebody can carry a large amount of responsibility and do so joyously and, and, and reliably and dependably, we say that person has broad shoulders. In, in China, they say that person has a large stomach. And the Buddha Maitreya is pictured as a rather corpulent guy with a big smile on his face. Not only is he handling all of the responsibilities that he has to, to, to carry out, but he handles them joyously. That for us is a, an amazingly important thing, to be able to do that and to be able to do it reliably, to be able to carry on day after day, irrespective of how we may feel about it when we start, knowing that we may feel much better when it's done. The cult of the performance of the rituals is not something that we do and forget. It's not a discipline that one can practice on Sunday and put down on Monday morning. If it's practiced in that way, the benefits, wisdom, and knowledge are, are all lost. They're, they're completely in vain. They will never be accessible. The cultivation of the Tao teachings occurs in the real world with real people, real situations, things that happen to us day in and day out, where we're called upon to use the skills and the knowledge and the wisdom that we acquire through cultivation and discipline to make our lives and the lives of others better. 
the true purpose of the performance of the rituals is that to keep us in that spiritual space where we are continually cultivating the teachings where we live in that energy where we're able to be compassionate and decent human beings no matter how badly the guy in the next cubicle is working to try and make us upset. It's a day in, day out, for the rest of our ever-loving lives, journey of self-refinement one day to enlightenment. To approach it in any other manner is to cheapen it to the point of worthlessness. And so, as we talk about the performance of the rituals and cultivating the teachings, every day we need to examine our hearts and determine whether or not we're stepping up to and live to the commitments that we've made to ourselves in the realm of cultivation. Not only do I try to have a uh, a mind space of gratitude and thankfulness but I try to remember the, the people around me who need help a whole bunch worse than I do and hope in karmic influences and wonderful spiritual synergies that I've seen work in my life can also work in theirs not because I hope to receive anything from it the, People that I care about that way don't even know that I remember them. I don't tell them. That's counterproductive. But because I have compassion for them, I hope that they get what they need. And that perhaps a little remembrance now and then might help tip the scales of karmic action somewhat in their favor. So if you're going to do the ritual, if you're interested in creating sacred space in your home and in your life, before you put that table in the corner, before you go out looking for a little bit ready to put up there, examine the room of your heart and mind and understand what it is you're asking to do. Those are the, the things that will cause the performance of the ritual product of cultivation to bear the fruit of spiritual refinement. You have to become discerning and not worry about what, what other people think or say or believe, particularly if they don't understand what it is that you're doing. Not understanding what it is that we're doing is a, a, a life situation that we all live with and will continue to live with until everybody in the West understands what it is the Yiguandao stands for as well as we do. But it's kind of our job to make sure that that happens without those of us with the karmic affinity to help those who are developing it learn the information isn't going to go far. It's our example that conveys that information. It's doing what's right even when everybody around you thinks what you're doing is wrong. It's about adhering to your integrity, your beliefs, your, your spiritual devotion, your devotion to your own true self. An absolute irrevocable will to continue to walk the path no matter how many times you fall down and heaven knows I've fallen down a bunch it happens when it happens you get up and you keep going that's what makes the trip worthwhile so rather than half an hour 
hopefully relatively exciting discussion on the mechanics of the rituals. You get half an hour of, of how and why and a little bit of understanding about some of the misunderstandings. I know the interest is there for many of you to begin to develop and build that sacred space and to go down this journey, to walk this path. And quite frankly, I'm completely in favor of every one of you doing so. But please do it for the right reasons and do it with the right understanding. Make the example count for something. Make the ritual something other than beseeching a ceramic statue for an A on the algebra test. Grow and cultivate yourselves and refine yourselves and improve yourselves and love every day that you get on this path. And if I can help you at all, don't ever hesitate to email me. Sometimes I'm slow, but I always answer, and I'm happy to do it. So hopefully what I shared with you this morning in a somewhat circuitous and rambling manner resonated out there with a the person who needed to hear it because I really felt strongly I needed to say this today. And as always, thank you so much for letting me share with you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Bill, thank you very much. Um, on, on the same topic of worship, you know, quote-unquote worship, um, I'd like to mention that the more different levels of Tao cultivators one encounters within this community, the more you will notice a difference to the way that different levels of people approach worship, quote unquote. In the beginning levels, oftentimes I hear the, uh, the novices uh, asking for protection, for divine protection as part of the, the worship, the rituals. I often hear about the request of divine favors whether it's protection, blessings, or you know any other kinds of requests uh, to be made of the divine. As we go to higher levels of understanding, those more refined, more spiritually attained cultivators, they are always uh, using worship in the sense of expressing gratitude you know, rather than requesting favors. So uh, that may not be completely clear from someone who's looking from the outside uh, and not realizing that there is actually uh, multiple layers of meaning that's possible, um, that's all covered by the same word, uh, worship. Let's go ahead and, and do the meeting closing ritual. Chiri. 面向佛堂持架三鞠躬一鞠躬再鞠躬三鞠躬持架各位点传十一鞠躬结班一鞠躬 OK guys, we are done.